Hello folks, welcome back to our lecture on the intellectual, philosophical, religious traditions of Eurasia called Gods and Men. Now we start part four, the search for justice, Confucius, Lao Tzu, and Socrates. And this is the first half of part four, the second half of part four dealing with the Greeks and Socrates uh, is presented in a separate video. We begin with China. China was ruled for over 900 years through almost the entirety of the first millennium BCE by the, the Zhou Dynasty, the Zhou Dynasty, whose dates you see here, 1045 to 256 BCE. Looking at the map of China, we see that the governing lands of the Zhou Dynasty were those central areas of old China centered around the eastern uh, stretches of the Yellow River and the Yangtze River, the river valleys here of, of central and eastern China. China today, of course, is much larger as a territorial state, but this was the traditional heartland of China, and it was here during uh, this transition from the Bronze Age to the Iron Age that the Zhou Dynasty ruled. This was a, a time in Chinese history, as it was throughout uh, this great region of Eurasia, of remarkable changes, uh, technological changes including the introduction of iron making in China during this period, uh, and the beginnings of the modern Chinese written script, essentially the same written script used in China today. Followed closely by the invention of the book, that is a volume of pages bound together and printed with writing, and not surprisingly then the book and the modern Chinese script combine to give birth now to some of the classic Chinese philosophy of the age. And we start with a tradition in China, a tradition of listening carefully. It is said that in the Zhou Dynasty there were officials solely responsible for collecting folk songs and ballads. Ancient peoples believed that folk songs reflected the local opinions of people about the king and the government, and from these folk songs and ballads then much could be learned about the popular views of government. Often the most notable of them were selected and arranged by government officials who over time compiled a volume of such folk songs and ballads from the Chinese countryside uh, that would come to form the great classic collection uh, in Chinese history known as the Book of Songs, the Book of Songs. You see here the lyrics from a traditional Chinese folk ballad that combined images of nature, uh, of the wild, merging with the affairs and concerns of government, uh, a naturalistic concern for government, that somehow governing must meet the rhythms of nature and be in conformity with the basic patterns of nature. This is a very, very old tradition in China, and we'll see it manifest in a couple of different ways here during the Iron Age. According to tradition, the Book of Songs, known in China as the Shi Xing, uh, was thought to have been written down first, written down, remember it was long an oral tradition of folk balladry and folk singing, not unlike Homer's great oral tradition of the Iliad and the Odyssey and others we've seen. 
but first written down, formally written down, sometime around 600 BCE, so right in the middle of this axial age, uh, this great age of intellectual and philosophical ferment, uh, and uh, is included, in fact, the Xi Jing in a larger collection in China known as the Five Classics. Tradition also holds that it was a scholar teacher named Kung Fu Tzu, that is Confucius, as we know him in the West, who first compiled and edited what became the Five Classics, and it was the Xi Jing in particular, that is the Book of Song, which by tradition Confucius gave high praise to and claimed that the people's sophistication and observation abilities, their listening capacities and interpersonal skills could be highly improved through the study of this great book, this book of songs. So attributed by tradition to Confucius is this emphasis on the writings and teachings of the book of songs. These poems are subtle and questioning and provide no easy answers. Which plant is not brown, which man is not sad, have pity on us soldiers treated as though we were not men. This sounds almost more like a protest song, maybe something circa 1968 in America perhaps, but uh, in fact it's an ancient Chinese, part of an ancient Chinese ballad that seems to have the lament of the soldier. Uh, whose obedience and never-ending duty uh, inspired this particular refrain. Confucius lived at a time, that is the historical figure Confucius, lived at a time of great political conflict in China when the Zhou dynasty was often engulfed in regional wars of one sort or another. Wars that were matched by the intellectual ferment of the age. Uh, sometimes hard times inspire that. Hard times can inspire great art, and great inspiration. And certainly it did in the case of Confucius, who was interested in promoting moral behavior, improving government by encouraging natural talent, the talent of individuals who could come to the aid of the Chinese kings and uh, help them facilitate the more efficient, more just forms of governing. Who was this man, Confucius? Well, born around the year 551 BCE in northern China. Uh, he later described himself simply as a man, quote, without rank and in humble circumstances. It's thought that he had opted for civil service due to his talents as a student and in mastering the new Chinese writing, but after a time grew disgusted with what he saw as the corruption and mediocrity of China's regional rulers. It is difficult to expect anything from men who stuff themselves with food the whole day taught Confucius while never using their minds in any way at all. So it was through these sort of these sayings attributed to Confucius that the teachings of the great sage would be passed down to his followers and from then on through the generations of Chinese history. As a way of resolving the endless political conflicts of the Zhou period, Confucius taught that a Ability and merit and talent was more important than family connection or, or blood in choosing the best government servants. In fact, replacing the nobility of blood, said Confucius, uh, China should focus on a, a different kind of nobility, the nobility of virtue and learnedness, an idea that gets Confucius frequently in trouble with China's ruling aristocrats. Here was, after all, a man who preached that the end of good government should be, should be justice and that the best means of obtaining justice was through an enlightened administration of the laws, not heavy oppression, not force, not crushing military weight. 
As a, as a result, it's thought Confucius may have offended some above him, whose own positions were vested in the traditions of the Chinese nobility. Uh, and perhaps that's why he was denied himself uh, any political position more important than those local governing posts, uh, the which is thought Confucius had, had earned, but not able to rise above them. To Confucius, government and society were simper, simply larger versions of the family, and what virtues worked in the governing of a family would writ large work in the governing of the people. The relation between superiors and inferiors, says Confucius, is like that between the wind and the grass. The grass must bend when the wind blows across it. So again, the naturalistic imagery here uh, applied metaphorically, if you will, uh, or proverbially to the job of governing. Governing, the grass must bend when the wind blows. So flexibility in government was more important than rigidity. To preserve harmony in a family, said Confucius, a father must be a perfect role model of integrity, whose power was based on more than just physical strength. But also, said Confucius, the concept of Ren, and Ren is central to Confucian teaching. What did it mean? Well, translated Ren meant honesty, sincerity, and a genuine concern for others. Ren was courteous. Ren was genuine. Ren was not arrogant. But instead, Ren was the quality of authenticity that bound individuals together in the bonds of affection, never just physical force and never just power alone. Society, he said, was a series of such relationships, each of which brought its own authority and obligation. The obligation of a ruler to his subjects. The obligation of a father to his sons. The obligation of a husband to his wife. And note here, this obligation was not one way. It was not simply the job of the subjects to be ruled, or the son to be governed, or the wife to obey. But instead, those in formal authority had a great obligation of ren, of courtesy, of justice, of harmony, to those whom they governed, a kind of reciprocity of obligations. Just as a friend to a friend, participants in such a relationship, being equal in that basic sense to one another. For Confucius, education was the key to developing correct moral behavior in these relationships. They could be taught, and it was the job of the teacher to bring them to the consciousness of the student, to be learned, to be embodied, and to be taught again to be put into practice. These were precepts for actual living. There were no claims of divine guidance or divine authority. Instead, Confucius grounded his teachings in the actual day-to-day -day lives of people. On the left, you see here Confucius shown with his students. No great pulpit, no great grandstand upon which the teacher would would tower above his students, but a, a position of great respect, but otherwise relative equality. One of his great students, in fact, one of those who would be responsible for preserving and purveying the teachings of Confucius was Mencius, who you see on the right here. Mencius, one of the leading students and interpreters of Confucius. We'll, we'll see in, in the different traditions, you know, uh, for example, in early Christianity, where you'll have the apostles, who are the leading students of Jesus. Uh, in Greece, as we'll see, the students of Socrates, such as Plato. Uh, and here in China, then, the students become the great interpreters and purveyors of the teachings of the masters. And notice Mencius here depicted holding a book. So don't forget the technology of writing and the invention, in fact, of the book in China will allow generations to have the teachings of the master. Teachings such as there could be no good government without a thorough understanding of what morality is, 
According to Confucius, the object of the superior man is truth. Not power, not wealth, but truth. So talking about good government, that which was most authentic, most in conformity with the natural way of things, uh, was for the, uh, the teacher here inseparable from a devotion to the understanding of truth. In teaching, said Confucius, there should be no distinction of classes. This wasn't about nobility versus the peasantry, say, the rich versus the non-rich, um, the uh, great versus the humble. In teaching, there should be no distinction of classes. This from the Analects. Uh, which are the combined teachings of Confucius, which now for generations, for hundreds of years, even thousands of years down to our own time, will be revered in China as the great sort of moral instruction of Chinese history. Morality and proper rituals should be the basis of good government, said Confucius. Lead the people with administrative injunctions and put them in their place with penal law, and they will avoid punishments but will be without a sense of shame. Lead them with excellence and put them in their place through roles and ritual practices, and in addition to developing a sense of shame, they will order themselves harmoniously. So something more than the fear of punishment, or even the expectation of reward, should motivate individuals to observe the law and to be harmonious in their dealings. Now, a different natural philosophy than Confucianism also emerged in China at the same time, or almost the same time, known in Chinese as the Tao, translated into English as the Way. According to legend, it was Lao Tzu who, like Confucius, was a minor government official at the time, who became disenchanted with corruption in government, in Chinese government. Unlike Confucius, however, Lao Tzu dropped out, you might say, left his home, and according to tradition, rode a water buffalo into the frontier, the frontier regions of western China, where he was never heard from again, leaving behind only his teachings. Lao Tzu was credited with formulating 81 basic moral principles in a short poetic work of teachings known as the Tao Te Ching, which translates into English as the way and its power. The Tao Te Ching offers teachings on the way to live in harmony with the universe and nature, including the best principles of government. But whereas Confucius taught striving and discipline and formal learning, the Tao taught the lessons of letting go, letting go of desire, letting go of striving and obsession with formal teaching. And though they are often uh, depicted as sort of opposites to one another, really in turn the traditions of China will see the teachings of Lao Tzu and Confucius ultimately as being reconcilable, although it's a bit fun to see Confucius as the refined city boy and Lao Tzu as the back-to-nature hippie, if you will, of Chinese history, such as this watercoloring, water coloring, which shows him riding uh, humbly on his, uh, his beast, uh, his water buffalo. Confucius roams within society, holds one tradition while Lao Tzu wanders beyond. And it's true, there was something countercultural about Lao Tzu's teaching, and his precepts seemed to contradict the formal schools of thought in China, which held that man could gain mastery over nature through the imposition of his will. In Taoism, however, nature is a great mystery and a way of ultimate truth, but a truth that can only be grasped by acknowledging that such mastery, as taught by Confucius, for example, that such mastery is an illusion. Free from desire, teaches Lao Tzu, you realize the mystery. Caught in desire, you see only 
the manifestations. It's worth noting that Taoism inspired a tradition of Chinese watercolor art, uh, which often depicted great landscape paintings in which human figures were dwarfed by nature's majesty and mystery. And you can see it here with the enormous detention to detail, the really exquisite, beautiful detention to detail with the, the, the jagged mountain peaks of the background, while in the foreground, the trees with their numberless branches and seeming sort of integration while here in the foreground, dwarfed by it all, nevertheless a kind of harmonious, simple uh, a scene of, of two figures, one sitting at a table, kneeling at a table, another in the background, while yet another comes through a gate. Uh, Taoists love that kind of simple, almost austere, living shorn of great uh, ornament or even material comforts, trying to approximate instead the basic, basic rhythms of nature uh, itself. The best ways of governing according to Lao Tzu were those that embodied the natural ways of the Tao. And note here the Tao, the way, uh, is interpreted as the totality of nature, what we might call the universal order of things. Uh, it wasn't a god, it wasn't a figure, an anthropomorphic figure like the Hebrew Lord or even uh, the Persian uh, Ahura Mazda. It was a disembodied oneness of all things, of, of natural energy and the organic integration of, of all things. Yet it was never oppressive or punishing. There was no hell, no Satan in the Tao, just the integration of all things. From the Tao Te Ching, can you coax your mind from its wandering and keep to the original oneness? Can you let your body become supple as a newborn child's? Can you cleanse your inner vision until you see nothing but the light? Can you love people and lead them without imposing your will? Can you deal with the most vital matters by letting events take their course? Can you step back from your own mind and thus understand all things, leading and not trying to control? This is the supreme virtue. So rich is this instruction from the Tao Te Ching, because what it says, unlike the Confucian teaching, which was uh, asserting of oneself, the asserting of oneself into the affairs of civil society, here there was a kind of stepping back, a kind of letting go, as he says, of letting events take their own natural course, not overreacting, not overimposing, and certainly not oppressing individuals. These were the qualities of the best rulers who approximated the Tao, and always not letting one's own ego, one's own ambition, if you will, uh, cloud or clutter uh, the natural flow of things. Uh, and according to Lao Tzu, the natural flow of things was best approximated uh, by water, the flow of water, just as it finds its own course, its own channel. Uh, even where there are obstructions, water finds its way past the obstructions. Sure, a stone may impede water, but over time that stone will be worn down and water will have its way. And so it would be in the affairs of man, according to Lao Tzu, if man and its governing forces were only willing to embody the ways, the natural ways, of the Tao. So here we have then in the works of Confucius and in the teachings of Lao Tzu a kind of naturalistic response both in their own ways to the problems confronting China during the Zhou Dynasty, to the problems of governing and the problem of maintaining peace and good order in particular. Uh, drawing upon the ancient folk songs and ballads that stretch back into Chinese history a thousand, two thousand, and more years uh, to the very beginnings of Chinese civilization, but now more formalized in the teachings and followings of the great sages Confucius uh, and Lao Tzu. All right, next we'll take a look at the second half of Part 4 and consider how yet another response to the questions of 
of good governing and the problems of harmonious relations uh, will be uh, taught in the case of the Greek uh, rationalists such as uh, such as Socrates so hang on uh, the second half of part two uh, still to come or I should say the second half of part four still to come